I'm a local journalist, and my job is relentless. I had spent a lifetime chasing down truth from rumors and following news that would frequently take me out of my hometown of Troy, Michigan. In 2014, the editorial team asked me to follow a story from Detroit. Normally, I would jump on any opportunity to leave home, but at the time, I had a strange feeling holding me back. A part of it was due to my uneasiness driving after my shoulder surgery, and partly due to listening to my colleagues say that Route 75 is a paranormal magnet. I was pacing outside my boss's office, thinking of some sort of excuse to do not go, and I noticed Frank packing up his desk. He was moving to another job outside of Troy, and that meant my chance for a promotion was maybe finally here. So, I decided to swallow my anxiousness and take on the story. I called my dad and asked if I can take his car, to which he replied, young journalists are not paid enough on their own yet. Detroit, well, I can come along and I'll stop at your Uncle Sean's place, my dad had answered me. I cringed from the inside, but agreed. We don't have much in common. I'm a timid, antisocial. He is outspoken and loud. However, I really wanted the Detroit store to help me with the promotion, and the road trip would probably mean a lot to him too. Neither of us had any commitment after work, so we headed right out afterwards, straight down Route 75. He tried churning up some conversation, but I was tired and wanted to be fully awake the next morning. So I started to nod off in the car. Detroit is not far from Troy, but every second felt like an hour. I do not remember when I actually fell asleep. Probably when Dad started telling strange stories of strange creatures that had been seen lurking near Troy at nighttime. Maybe I should have been paying attention to this part. Not soon into the trip, I heard a loud thud, hitting my head on the car window as I was leaning towards. Hey, are you up? My dad said. I think I saw something. Probably it was nothing, he whispered. I shook my head, no, and just answered in murmurs. It was dark. We were no longer on Route 75. I remember making frustrated remarks but his attention was completely elsewhere, his hands gripping the steering wheel. You were asleep. There was an accident on Route 75, and I knew a way to bypass it over here by the fairgrounds and the cemetery. I rolled my eyes as I reached in my pockets to open the map on my phone. I tried to unlock my phone, but realized it was completely dead. I was so fixated on reaching Detroit that it had slipped my mind to charge it before leaving. The car kept moving along, but then it seemed to slow down. I opened my eyes wider, turning towards my dad to see his eyes wide open and staring at the rearview mirror. I still remember the look on his face, his jaw hanging down. He kept driving ahead slowly, but his eyes were glued to the rearview mirror, not knowing what was going on. I asked him to let me drive, while Dad kept asking me, strange questions not stopping. I asked him again to stop the car and switch seats with me. He was hesitant at first, but finally agreed. I got out of the car and soon after getting out, a noise from off in the direction of the cemetery caught my attention. I was looking around to find the source. I scanned the horizon looking for whatever it was and what I saw was nothing like I could have ever imagined. What I was seeing was a dark-haired, furry, wolf-looking creature, huge in size, about as big as a fully-grown horse. I squinted my eyes, thinking it was a play of the light, but the bright yellow eyes that were staring back into mine were definitely real. Even though the creature was at least a few hundred feet away from us, his incredible size was clearly noticeable, its presence behind our stopped car, looking towards us, was just something I could feel, even that far away. 
I'll never forget the feeling I had when I first looked at it. It was majestic. It had a sense of undeniable power. I felt it could make anybody feel shivers down their spine and make their hands quiver, just like how I felt in that very moment. However, I'm a journalist, so I decide I can capture this beast with my camera, show people what I saw. I very slowly moved my hand, reaching for the door handle, while also reaching for my camera. In my hand, I was moving slowly enough that I would not be noticed by the creature, who was still a distance away. Unlucky for me, I was wrong. The beast howled a cry at the most unbelievable spectrum and rose up back on its two back feet. Its muscled body was now easily nine feet tall, and its dark fur made it seem even more ominous and horrifying. However, the strangest part of this vision was the creature's human-like build. It was striking. The only typical wolf features were the tail, the sharp set of paws at the end of each limb, and the snarling wolf head. By this point, my dad jumped inside the car to the passenger seat, and I had moved across the driver's side. He quickly helped me open the seat door and yanked me inside, yelling me to hit the accelerator. At first, I was in shock, but as he pushed my knee and slapped me to my senses, I shut the half-open door, pressing the pedal to its limit, without ever looking back in the rearview mirror. My hands were gripping the steering wheel, white-knuckled. I was still shaking as I drove away and tried to process what had just happened these past one to two longest minutes of my life. My father saw it too, and he knew what he saw, but cannot verbally acknowledge it. As far as I'm concerned, I hope it's the first and the last time I catch a glimpse of the notorious Dogman of Michigan. I've had a lot of unusual things happen to me in my life, but nothing so peculiar as that May 19th, 2017, when my husband and I visited the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast here in Massachusetts. What was supposed to be a spooky fun trip turned out to be the most frightening night of all our lives, and it wasn't the house that left a lasting memory, but what happened afterwards that really stuck with us. I was always fascinated with the supernatural. My husband was more of a skeptical type. I convinced him to come with me to one of America's most haunted sites to prove to him the existence of ghosts. We made a little bet. If he saw something he logically could not explain, well, I could go buy some new clothes and he'd have to accompany me on some other historically haunted places. If nothing ever happened, well, he appeared to be staged and I would never bother him with my paranormal fascination ever again. I knew I'd win. I could feel it in my blood. So, we started on a long drive down the highway to Fall River, Massachusetts. When we got to the bed and breakfast, we traveled with a small group and a very knowledgeable tour guide. We were able to see every room in the old Victorian home. Supposedly, the site was famous for a double murder from 1892. The daughter of Andrew Borden Lizzie Borden was suspected by many to have been the culprit of her father and stepmother's murder, but the court let her go, assuming she was innocent. After her court victory, she immediately sold the house. It was later turned into a bed and breakfast, but visitors were so often spooked. We stayed in the John V. Morse room where Abby Borden was actually found murdered. We left the door shut, but during the night, it mysteriously popped open on us. I could feel the negativity in the air increasing. The temperature in the room had dropped considerably. I knew we were definitely not alone. My husband just groggily said the door had clearly not been shut tightly, and the airflow in the room was to blame for the door opening, not ghosts. He did complain, though, of the room being cold. As we sat up in bed, debating who was right, a shadow traveled across the hallway 
with no body accompanying it. We both clearly saw it, and I could tell from the look on his face that he was now a believer. We looked at each other, rushing for the exit. We only briefly stopped to pay for our stay before heading into the early morning darkness. We fumbled with our keys as we hurried toward the vehicle. That's when we saw it. It was a good way to describe this being. Half man, half dog, with the head of a canine. The creature was literally lurking around the barn that had been reconstructed into a gift shop. I couldn't speak. I was too stunned. Instead, I tugged on my husband's sleeve, and he was super focused on getting our stuff back into the trunk. He did not even notice that thing was standing upright on two legs. I took a step back. I didn't even mean to do it. It was sort of instinctual. I wasn't sure if what I was seeing at first was new, or maybe that something science had been experimenting on, and, or perhaps something mythical that man had not yet known about. I whispered to my husband as this canine-like creature plopped down on all fours and stared at us hesitantly. My husband, who was still traumatized by the sight of the ghost in the bed and breakfast, wasn't even noticing the creature approach us with a sort of wild curiosity. I bravely stepped past my husband and could now see the creature's vibrant, aggressive, intelligent eyes. Its head looked kind of like that of an Australian shepherd, and it was amazing, but frightening all at the same time. It kind of had like a mane, if that makes sense, and its arms and body was so muscular and wide, I couldn't imagine much standing in his way. This thing was utterly terrifying, but it had spotted patches of black all around the back, and its gaze had me rooted in place. I kind of wanted to lean forward to get a better look, but just then, my husband slammed the trunk, and the creature jumped off and ran to the back. I was kind of annoyed, and I turned and flashed my clueless spouse a look, asked what he did if he saw that thing. He only shrugged, having clearly missed the whole thing. So, we both climbed into the vehicle and began our long drive home. I can never get the encounter out of my mind and even went with my best friend on vacation back to the same bed and breakfast, just hoping to see the creature that had been lurking outside this barn just outside the view of others. We both saw some strange things we could not explain, not to mention all the paranormal activity surrounding the property. But sadly, like I just said, the dogman wasn't the only thing, though I never did see this creature again, this was also near a wooded area, and it was one of the strangest experiences I've ever had, and definitely one I will never forget as long as I live. It was late October 2017, close to Halloween, and I was living in New Hampshire at the time. Some friends and I decided to go to one of those big city Halloween parties, except we later figured out it was for teens. I thought it was going to be lame like all the other parties I'd been to in the past. Man, I could not have been more wrong if I tried. That Halloween night will stay with me for the rest of my life. My costume was pretty lame, but my mom had made it for me, and I did not want to hurt her feelings. So, I wore it regardless. My friends were all dressed in way better costumes, but oh well. We were all ready to kick back and have some fun for the rest of the evening. There was just one catch. We had to cut through a notoriously creepy cemetery to get to this party. It had seemed to stretch on for miles. To me, it looked like a sea of endless tombstones. I really appreciated the eerie atmosphere, though. It was perfect for something strange to happen. My friends and I were all striking poses in some creepy old granite mausoleum with a bunch of columns in front of it. The place looked really old. They all waved to me to join them in their photo shoot, but my eyes were fixed on something different entirely. And that's when things got really weird. As I got closer, peering out from beyond the shadows of the mausoleum was a pair of bright yellow eyes. It was as if they were silently beckoning me, 
curiously and almost in a trance from their glow. I stared past my friends and continued to close the gap between myself and whatever it is. As I got closer, I can make out a snout and dark gray fur. A low, guttural growl escaped its smoky gray muzzle. It didn't sound like a growl of malice. It was more like some kind of restless discontentment, its head slowly peeking out of the shadows. Under the bright moonlight, I could see it much more defined, its body covered in fur and a head to its collarbone. But the upper torso was completely human, yet almost triangular in build, with its massive muscle arms that all seemed to thin out right down to the waist. From there, the body became canine again, its long and fluffy tail stood erect behind it as it decided whether or not I was friend or foe. I held up my hand like I would any new dog I was meeting for the first time. I took a few hesitant steps towards me and then stopped just as quickly. Under better lighting, I could see the bits of medium brown fur hidden with the gray-black strands. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I mean, Part of me wanted to touch the fur on its head, and the yellow eyes were horrifyingly captivating. They were wild and kind of evil, actually. It was strange. So, I kind of seemed locked in this trance, like it was capturing its prey, and I felt nothing except going towards it more and more slowly. This thing came towards me. I could see the reflection of the moisture on its black nose. I knew this was much more than a person in a costume. But even though it was vicious, it had not yet attacked me. It was more intelligent than that, like it was planning on something. Suddenly, my boyfriend motioned to me with his arm as he called over to me to rejoin the group. I gasped at the sound of his voice. It must have startled the creature, for it froze in place and analyzed where the sound had come from very intelligently looking, mind you. Its ears kind of twitched and it rushed back into the shadows. It was terrifying. This thing did not belong in this realm. People might turn into some sort of strange experiment or something. I don't know. I was relieved. Who knows what it would have done to me had I actually made my way to it. It's almost like it mind-controlled me. I almost wonder if there's more of them. I mean... There had to have been more than one for it to physically exist. I thought about it the rest of the night, but never told them what exactly I saw. I mean, something like that on a Halloween night? How many people get to say they experienced that? I just remember how incredibly bright it was that night. That's the only reason I saw as many details as I did. I thought I saw that same familiar gray-black-brown of its body slipping into the nearby trees, but after squinting, I couldn't exactly see, not without the proper lighting. That was the last time I ever saw a strange creature, at least like that. Later on, though, I would eventually tell my friends about what I'd witnessed. My boyfriend just thought I was imagining things, and just saying, yeah, the darkness played tricks in your eyes, you're being too dramatic and maybe my friends thought I was trying to set the mood for spooky fun. But one thing's for sure, I'll never forget that harrowing account. Never. I used to be a canvasser for a consumer protection organization. For those who don't know what that means, a canvasser is somebody who walks around town, going door to door, knocking on strangers' doors, with a clipboard to ask for donations or spread awareness for a specific cause. The cause we were all working on was pipelines, and the governor's lack of commitment to limit pipelines and new oil and gas infrastructure in the state. As you might imagine, it's a tough job, both physically, because we each walked about 10 miles a day at work, and emotionally, because the most common response to our knock was a shut in the face. Also, I've been threatened with a gun. I've been hit on by a clearly naked person. And I've had the cops call on me more than my fair share. But honestly, I kind of get it. 
we're interrupting these people at home without their permission. And yes, as late as 8.30 at night. We're strangers, and I specifically am a rather large bearded man. I wouldn't harm a fly, and I consider myself a rather jovial, carefree person. But random people don't know that when they see me walking up to their house. So again, I get some more of their extreme reactions to a certain extent. One night though, I'll never forget this. I got the crap scared out of me. I knocked on a door and nobody answered. Next house. I knocked on the door, chatted with the nice guy for a few moments, and although this did not result in any donations or anyone signing up to become a member of my organization, I always appreciated nice small talk chats to break up the monetary perpetual rejection. Finally, I came up to one of the last houses on my route. It looked like it used to be some sort of old Gatsby-esque house, but it had fallen into disrepair. I knocked on the door, and in an instant, it swung open. This woman with large glassy black eyes and a face full of wrinkles, wearing a white nightgown with messy white hair, was staring at me. She stared at me so intensely, it felt like her eyes could cut right through me leaving a hole in the sidewalk behind me. Her eyes were lifeless. I gulped audibly. I didn't even know until that moment that was the real thing people do when they're scared. I managed to open my mouth but just barely squeak out a hi ma'am when the door swung shut in front of me. So hard, I thought it might break. While this might sound like a normal encounter on paper, there was something so intense, so unnerving, about that woman's empty stare that it sent me on edge for the rest of the night. Honestly, I would never tell my boss this. I just filled out the rest of my sheet saying everybody else was not home so that I would not have to keep working. I took out my phone to watch YouTube or maybe text my friends. Anything to take my mind off that woman. But I had no signal so I decided to just walk around a bit. As I walk along the empty streets, I realize there's something creepy about the suburbs when you're the only one on the street and all the house lights are off. When it's quiet and still like that, you realize you were just exposed. Every horror movie you've ever seen comes back to you, and you imagine that Freddy Krueger is right behind you, posed to attack. I kept walking down these empty streets looking for any sign of life so that I'd feel better. I knew my boss was not backing me up, and I'll tell you what, that scared me. It was the longest 20 minutes of my life. I turned a corner and saw some houses with their lights on, and decided to head that way. Like I said, I was done working for the night. That lady definitely shook me up too much to have any real motivation, but just knowing there were other people awake calmed my nerves. It's not real protection, but... It's psychological ease of mind. I was walking towards the houses and already beginning to feel a little bit better. That's when I heard a ruffling in the trees alongside me. My heart dropped. I decided to pick up the pace, and to my horror, the ruffling followed me and picked up its pace too. I considered running, but the rational side of my brain took over, and I realized that whatever this was was probably just an animal and that if it was an animal, it could easily outrun me. So, my best bet was to make myself big and make loud noises to scare it off. I have no idea if this works for every predator, but that's what I went with. I got up as big as I could with my clipboard in my hand and yelled, Ugh! towards the trees. To my shock and absolute terror, the creature in the woods raised itself up too and made itself bigger. And in that moment of horror, that's when I got my first real look at it. The first thing I noticed was its paws, how huge they were. And my first thought was that I royally messed up with this bear. Then I saw the fur. It was kind of dark and not really like a bear's. So I started to calm down, thinking maybe this was just some sort of big dog. But then it raised its head above the small brush. That's when I realized this thing was a wolf, 
well, not a wolf. It had a wolf's head. But it also had that unmistakably man's body. At first, maybe this was some sicko wearing an advanced wolf mask, like in the movie Saw or something, but it opened its mouth, and I clearly saw saliva dripping out of its mouth, and the deep shine in its eyes. I realized in that moment, this was no mask. This was somehow a creature with the body of a human, and the features of a wolf. I was too scared to move. The wolfman creature took one step towards me, and my first instinct was to hurl my clipboard at it. I will never, to the day I die, stop being grateful that my clipboard made contact and promptly distracted this creature for a couple of seconds. It seemed distracted and kind of grumbled, and you bet that I took that time to run as fast as I could. You know what? At that point, screw my job. I don't even care. So I ran down the street, got a good signal, called my boss, and told him, you need to pick me up now. I don't care. This is urgent. Come here now. Well, thankfully he listened. There was more than enough urgency in my voice for him to accept what I was telling him. But you know, even when we got in the car, I never told my boss what I saw and he never asked me, but he knew something was up. My body language and the look on my face told me everything. I quit my job a week later. When I was a kid, I went on a class field trip to celebrate the 100th day of school. It was a tradition in our high school that every year we'd all vote on a list of places to go. Whichever place got the most votes, in my year, we chose Glacier National Park. I remember literally running home to school the day they gave us the permission slips for my parents to sign. They signed, of course, and I couldn't even sleep that night. I was so excited. I had to start mentally preparing. All I could think about was hiking and being out in the trees and mountains and all the amazing wildlife. Of course, I was just a teenager, so the idea of bears was appealing to me rather than scary. But I really wanted to see elk and moose and wolves. All the fun stuff that I did not have a chance to see growing up in the relatively populated Columbia Falls. In case you couldn't tell already how bored I was by everyday life, after handing in my slip, I spent days pursuing online retailers, looking at hiking gear and everything, watching documentaries and countless YouTube videos. What turned my interest from a spark to a full-on explosion was the announcement that our school was going to hold a bake sale to raise money for us to stay there overnight. I was ecstatic. Little did I know that I would see something on that trip that would not only ruin my love for the outdoors for a while, but also sent me to therapy for years following. After months of anxiously waiting, or maybe weeks, but certainly felt like months, the day arrived, obviously, and I could not sleep the night before. I just had to keep double-checking, triple-checking, making sure everything was packed. I made sure to bring extra film, got my sunscreen, my bug spray, and kept thinking about all the wonderful adventures we'd go on to as a class. And as you can imagine, the trip was kind of a letdown. Of course, the park is gorgeous, and eating lunch amidst the mountains was insanely cool. I'll never forget that. But the trip was mostly educational. We learned about all the different stuff, the difference between deciduous and coniferous trees. We learned about the mountains and the different layers of rock and soil that likely went into their composition. As an adult looking back on this trip, this actually does sound kind of interesting, and I have gone back and looked up some of this information again. But as a 14-year-old, every science fact spouted by our teacher just robbed me of little hope, more hope that I'd end the day by riding a bear or making friends with a group of elk. As the day wound down, light turned into night, and we all had some free time to goof off, play our Game Boys, whatever. I didn't have many friends in class yet since this was my first year, and I was coming from a middle school a few towns away, and my family had just moved. Anyway, 
Eventually, dinner was ready. So, I sat down next to this kid, Brian. We kept chatting, and he introduced me to his friends, Margaret and Pete. I recognized the girl from around school, but had no idea who Pete was. Turns out, he sat behind me, and Brian and I just never noticed him. We ate dinner, and as soon as the plates were cleared and everybody was back in my free time, we ducked out and made our escape. Margaret stuck out first, and she was almost caught. Next was Brian and then Pete. Finally me. My heart was racing as I evaded the menacing teachers. I had never done anything this daring before, which is why I was so excited to even just step foot in a national park. We were grouped just a few yards away from all the other kids. In retrospect, we were definitely still within eyesight, but we felt like four little Indiana Joneses, trekking our way through the wilderness. To any kids listening to this right now, I cannot stress enough, this was a stupid idea. We could have all been seriously injured, and no adults would have known where we were to help. But we were young and dumb. Once we're sufficiently far from everyone else, and giddy, we turn on our flashlights. Sure enough, we were kind of lost. We were exhilarated, but, as kids do, completely failed to make a plan. That's when we realized something was wrong. We turned a corner, and we saw something that scared the crap out of all of us. Nobody would believe us, but what we all saw was real. We saw a creature with the head of a wolf and the body of a man. At first, I thought it was somebody wearing a mask, but it let out this deep growl that sent my heart racing and my brain into panic mode immediately. That's when Brian shrieked, and luckily, that was enough for this thing to turn around and sprint off into the woods. Except it didn't run away. It was following us, coming after us as we ran, hiding in the woods for cover, but still staying right with us. We could hear it sprinting and its heavy thuds as it galloped alongside of us, probably waiting for the right opportunity to reach out and grab one of us and cover. That's when I saw brief flashes of its hind legs, and where I expected to see its paw come out and grab one of us, I saw some kind of misshapen foot-paw hybrid. We all kept running and eventually made it back to camp without anybody being grabbed or snatched or eaten. Nobody had even realized we had left. I know my encounter short, but to this day, whenever we talk, which is rare, we will still talk about that night. What we saw and our shared struggle that nobody will believe us. This happened just outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I have never considered myself to be superstitious. In fact, I have taken to building a career on the breaking down of this world's superstitious elements, having studied and worked in the fields of anthropology. Yet, despite this, one particular encounter that I had as a child stands out in my memory, never fading. One that by all accounts borders on the supernatural, and in the least, will go without explanation for a long time to come. I was a young girl when it happened, just 10 years old, and it was a Saturday, November 20th. I was with my best friend at the time, a young girl named Cindy, and we decided to spend our entire weekend at Penn Museum to research a school project. Cindy's father was a curator at the museum, and he gave tours on ancient civilizations, which granted us behind the scenes to the ancient Egyptian artifacts. We were also happy to be with a treasure trove of knowledge. Although we were young children, whose passions lied elsewhere at the time, all the artifacts and knowledge that they had on display were truly awe-inspiring, and it could very well have been prompted by my interest in science. As Cindy and I decided to make full use of our time in the museum by exploring as much of all the exhibits as we could, it was already dark outside when we finally settled down in the ancient Egyptian exhibit and began to work on our projects. Actually, the museum was already closed to visitors, and Cindy's father urged us to hurry it up so we can make it home in time for dinner. I was staying near the museum in a small apartment 
with my mom who would work in the city. My school was also nearby too, so it was convenient. Cindy's father asked whether anybody was coming to pick me up, and I told him that my mother would come to pick me up. He seemed reluctant at first, but eventually agreed to let me leave the museum. I gave our project to Cindy for safekeeping and headed out of the museum, ready to go home. And although it might seem dangerous for a young 10-year-old girl to be walking around the streets of Philadelphia alone at night, it was something I had done before this incident, so I figured this time it wouldn't be any different. There was a rather big stretch of forest that I would have to cross in order to get home, which did worry me a bit. This was dark after all. But it was private land and it was near the university, which meant there's a lot of patrolling security in the area. I mean, I figured if something happens or somebody tries to mug me or hurt me, I figured I could flag down somebody. So I almost immediately picked up on a very strange smell, one that reminded me of a wild animal. It kind of smelled like wild dog or something. I don't know, like wet dog and stink. Anyway, I couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from, but since the patch of urban forest was near Penn Park, I figured it could have been an elk or deer. Maybe the owner of the land was trying his hand at farming. But as I progressed further, the smell became much more pronounced. As I went so deep into the property, that for a second, I forgot I was in the city. And as I made it halfway through the property, the smell now soon turned into an actual sound I could hear. It started with twigs breaking underfoot and some crunching. I could tell whatever it was was making the sound was rather large. I paused for a second, and whatever was making the sound seemed to pause and sync with me. I looked around in hopes of seeing what was making the noise and giving off this awful feral scent. I caught a large silhouette in the corner of my eye. I focused my head toward it and almost fell flat on my back when I saw it. A couple of feet in front of me, a seven-foot-tall, monstrously built creature, covered from head to toe in fur. Its head was that of a wolf or a canine, with the rest of its body like that of a well-built man. It almost resembled that of a silverback gorilla, in body, of course, with the head of a wolf. I literally couldn't figure out what I was seeing. The whole time I was watching it, it stood totally upright, like a man would. And as I picked myself up off the ground, this thing proceeds towards me, which in turn prompted me to bolt towards the nearest point of exit. I had far too much adrenaline going through me. As I came hurtling towards the nearest street, a car pulled up alongside me. It was none other than Cindy and her father, who said he had followed me in his car when he saw me walking alone, but that I entered the property with the trees before he could offer me a ride. I told him what I'd seen and Although I could see he didn't exactly believe me on what I had seen, we did call the police to investigate. In turn, they tracked down and contacted the owner to confirm that there were signs of some sort of large unknown canine on the property, although nobody could say for sure. Perhaps one day with the tools I've acquired in training, in practice, in archaeology, that mystery is something I could finally answer. The year was 2013, and I had spent the day with my girlfriend at the time at a nearby lake when we saw this huge hairy creature with a snout crossing one of the smaller roads. It scared us, but I tried to joke and play it off and say, oh look babe, it's your dad. Her dad is a really lumbering, tall and very hairy man. My girlfriend at the time was very into the weird side of science, like Bigfoot and things of that nature. We talked about our sighting together, and she said that from what she knows about Bigfoots, they don't have snouts, and they don't look like a bear or a dog, and their heads are more cone-shaped. So we weren't really sure what to think about the whole ordeal. Later on in the day, we went and checked for tracks, which we couldn't find any. We looked where it had walked, but where it had walked over was gravel and thick grass with hard ground underneath. This thing walked from one side of the woods to the next, 
but it was in an open enough area where there was only sparse amount of tree coverage, and this is where we had full view of it without it ever seeing us. The sighting happened at around 3 p.m. in broad daylight. We had a perfect view in our sighting. The creature we saw was bulky and massive and covered in long reddish brown hair. Since it was walking semi in our direction, we got a fairly decent look at its face and can see that it had a strong brow ridge and a shorter snout resembling that of a bear or a bigger dog. I didn't see any ears to recall seeing any ears. Its arms were very long, and I couldn't really see any feet or anything specific about the hands, just because of the angle we were at. Its stride, though, was pretty humongous, considering it cleared the small gravel road in just three to four strides and was already off to a different segment of woods. Driving down a back road at around midnight with headlights and brights on, I saw a large, tall black animal walking on its back two legs toward my vehicle at first and then off into the road. It crossed the road really fast. When I saw it, it was in the middle of the road, approaching me, and there was no other traffic on the road. I was coming around a sharp curve or bend in the road when I saw it. It had a surprised expression on its face. I was in shock myself and I did not even think to put the brakes on. So this thing jumps out on the road, turns and walks towards me, and then is off to the other side of the road in a flash. I drive through, and I'm still in total shock at what I saw. I was on my way home from a late family outing, and one of the quickest ways is through this backcountry road. I've been driving through here for years, and I've never seen anything like that creature before in my life. I'll never forget its glowing yellow eyes. They look so unnatural, like you can get lost in them. I almost felt like if I would have stared at them long enough, I would have been in a trance. This entire thing was unnatural looking. Afterwards, I had to keep rubbing my eyes just to make sure I wasn't hallucinating or in a dream. When I got home, I spent about an hour researching and trying to find anything I could that would point me in the direction of matching the description of what I saw. I stumbled upon things like Bigfoot Encounters and the BFRO, but nothing on that website that I started looking through pointed me in the right direction. So I continued to search more and more, and that's when I found a creature called the Dogman. I spent some time reading up on stories that people had submitted, and that's when I came to these Cryptid Encounter YouTube channels, just like yours. I noticed yours, however, was one of the bigger ones, and so I began listening to the stories submitted by eyewitnesses. I was so shocked to conclude that this is the same creature that I saw that night. I must have caught it right as it was crossing the road, and I didn't realize I would be whipping right around the bend like that. The speed limit around the bend is 30, but the road was 45 itself. Since I know the road pretty well, and I would consider myself a local, like I said, I drive it a lot, so I was probably actually driving closer to 40 to 50 around the bed, and wham, my brights lit this thing up like a Christmas tree. I'm a guy that normally doesn't believe in Bigfoot or any of that silly stuff. In fact, I've always found it very silly, but now that I've had my own sighting of a dogman creature, maybe there's more out there than science refuses to acknowledge. Maybe science can't explain everything like I thought it could. Anyway, I wanted to personally reach out to you and thank you for being such a good resource for us out here to submit our encounters to and for us to share our experiences and stories to those who may not have had any. While my encounter with this creature wasn't necessarily violent or hostile, it could have gone that way rather quickly because from what I know, these creatures can be very unpredictable. And sure, it might have just been crossing the road innocently for all I know. That doesn't mean I would have wanted to run into this thing while I was out of my truck. I'll never forget my horrible sighting of a living, breathing nightmare. I saw a horrible sight at night, back in the winter time, when me and three of my friends and I were around this frozen lake nearby. 
we started seeing this large black humanoid creature walking on two legs through the brush on the other side of the lake. The creature never saw us or would stop to look at us. It was about eight feet tall, judging by what we know of the area, and walking like a proud giant. We first thought it was one of our friends in a costume trying to prank us. But then, why would any of our friends come out here in the winter night where it's cold, in a costume? But when we got a little closer, we realized that it was indeed walking just like a human. We were all hunters and have had extensive firearms training, and even we felt compelled not to shoot at something like this. We could not believe what it was we were seeing. We got so scared, we broke off from our group and went back to see if we could see this thing again after it moved away. However, we were unsuccessful in seeing it. It walked around the frozen lake and walked over a little incline deep into the dead woods. The lake or pond is only about 15 feet deep in the deepest parts, so some of the water is frozen, if not all of it, but it is shallow, and the shallow parts you can fall through, which is only about 3 feet deep. The one thing that does amaze me and scare me is the creature's feet did not leave any human-like tracks, even though it just walked like a human. They were large bipedal canine tracks. Again, the creature was completely black. I know the area well and have hunted here my entire life. In fact, very recently, the wildlife up here has almost totally disappeared in just the recent years. I don't know if the sighting we had had any connection to that. I've been up north for hunting and fishing for years and have never experienced anything like this, so I don't know why I did down here. I do know of two other incidents that happened in the same area. Maybe I can get one of my friends to share this with you. But one was a sighting years ago in the same area, and the other a couple of months ago in another different area. I can tell you quite bluntly and very firmly that this is not a case of mistaken identity. This creature clearly resembled an upright walking creature, black as the night and covered in dark, long, matted hair. I have never seen anything like it in the area, and I've spent endless days and nights up here before scouting. Whatever this creature was appeared to be on a mission because it was walking on a fast pace, not to be distracted by anything like us. Who knows where it was headed and what it was planning on doing. Dogmen are very real creatures. I have had two different encounters with three of them. My first encounter took place in March of 2018. I was walking in the woods behind my parents' house. It was around 11 p.m. and I was walking through an area where you have to go down around a pond. As I was walking down, I began to hear a very loud guttural growl. At first I thought it was a bear, but it was too loud and the growl was very close to the left of me. Then, about a meter and a half away, there was another creature that I did not hear, but I saw movement. That's when I realized whatever this was, there were two of them, one surrounding me and the other off to my right that I then heard another growl from. That's it, I thought. I was in grave danger. When I got to the spot where I saw both creatures, they both growled again, and then the tree that I was near began shaking violently, which again was right near me. I slowly began to back away, but the two creatures were still there, almost as if they were trying to bait me to walk closer. I slowly made my way back to my parents' house without either of them following me by going very, very slowly. If I turned and ran, I thought they would just give chase and I would be a dead man. My parents were outside talking, and they asked me what was going on seeing me coming back up so soon, since when I normally would go down there, I would spend a long time. I told them what had happened, and to my surprise, they appeared to believe me, or maybe they knew something I didn't, because both of their faces went white. I didn't have the words to really describe what I saw myself that night. I felt like I was walking around in a real life horror movie. The second encounter took place on May 7th of 2018, around 12.30 in the morning. I was walking back to my car after dropping my friend off at the airport. 
I was roughly a quarter of the way to my destination when I started hearing a sound that reminded me of a wolf or a coyote, a howling very distant in the wind. My windows were rolled down and the sound kept getting closer and closer. I was driving slow. It sounded like something was running directly at my car and it began to get so loud that the vibrations hurt my chest. I could feel something big was coming. So I slowed my car to see what I was hearing, to listen closer. I saw two eyes, a large head, a torso that was massive, and a long strides breaking out of the trees on the side of the road, headed towards my vehicle. The creature was about to cross and jump into the road, but stopped in its path as soon as it broke into the opening, staring me down from the woods. This thing was a hulking behemoth and I wasn't going to waste any time staring at that thing more than I needed to. I got out of there as fast as I could. To give you an idea, a visual, so to speak, if you've ever seen what a minotaur looks like, very humanoid looking, a fully ripped bodybuilder body, ripped legs, ripped arms, huge hands, imagine that with the hawks of a dog and dog feet with huge hands and claws, and then for the head, just a big dog head, that more or not resemble the German Shepherd. That's what this thing looked like, and it was probably around 8 to 9 feet tall, if not bigger. When I say this thing was huge, I mean it was unrealistically huge. Anyway, that's my story. I hope you enjoyed it. Back last year, before all the quarantine, I was a little bit south of Kelton which is northwest of Salt Lake City in Utah, and I saw a massive dog running around. I don't know if it was wild or what, but I've never heard of wild dogs out there, let alone ones this size. At first, when I got out of my truck, I thought this thing was a massive black lion, until I got a closer look and realized it looked very much like a dog. With the way it ran though, it was very much like a cheetah in the way that its back was arched it kept its entire head very low to the ground and its ears back. I've never in my life seen a dog breed look exactly like that or as large. It almost reminded me of my friend's jet black mastiff who's massive. I saw it running off in the distance before finally disappearing behind some trees. It was my first time ever seeing a wild dog that big until I asked a friend of mine who's an animal expert and I asked him about wild dogs living in North America. She informed me that there is no such thing as a wild dog living in North America that fits the description that I gave her. She went on to educate me about wild dogs that are even in other parts of the world, like Africa for example, none of which again have the same description that I gave her. So what exactly did I see that day? Even she herself wasn't sure, because nothing matches that description that is currently supposed to be living in the wild. Is it possible that I was witness to an undiscovered species of wild dog living in North America? Maybe it's not a wild dog at all, considering the only part that was remotely dog was its head. The rest of its body was different shaped, especially the way it arched its back like I told you. Its limbs didn't even look correctly portioned the same way a dog's does. It had longer front legs and shorter back legs, and again, the back was arched different. It even looked different than a dog as it ran on all fours, and was faster as well. I guess the thought of an undiscovered species of wild dog out here is possible. It is pretty remote. Maybe I just stumbled upon something nature never intended for me to see. What are your thoughts and feelings on this? My sighting of a massive wolf dog creature eating a dead cow on the side of NM 36 happened south of Gallup, New Mexico, into the Zuni Reservation. It was in the early morning hours, and I was driving south. No other cars around me at the time. I was on my way to meet a client and seal a deal when I saw something on the side of the road that gave me nightmares, and still does. Partially laying in the road was a bull, a dead bull, being partially eaten on by this creature. The back half of this steer was lying in the middle of the road, or at least on the side, enough that to get around it you had to swerve into the oncoming lane. I got a good look at the side profile of this thing eating on it. It looked like the perfect blend of a man and a coyote, 
a shorter snout, higher cheekbones, and the bones around the eyes looked very human. But the body, the body was very manlike too, but it had hands that kind of resembled the raccoon. But they still did resemble more of paws, if I'm trying to be as accurate as possible. I couldn't tell if it had a tail or what the feet looked like, because the way it was hunched over eating. As I came up to the grisly scene, I slowed down and just stared at this thing eating the cow and just slowly swerved around the scene and then continued on. This thing never once even bothered to look up at me or my car going by. It either didn't know I was there or was just choosing to ignore me while it feasted on its meal. From the scene that I witnessed, I can only imagine possibly that a loose steer got away and this creature chased it and finally got it right as it crossed this road. That's my only guess as to why there was a steer laying halfway into the road and this thing eating on it. Had anybody else driven by, they would have seen the same thing. And no, I didn't bother to call the police or anybody to let them know. I just figured that in the moment, the scene would work itself out. Judging by how much of the steer was eaten, I would say it had been there for at least an hour or two, eating on a good amount of the meat. It wasn't freshly dead. Is it possible that this steer had gotten loose and was crossing the road when a semi hit it? Yes, but I didn't get a look at the steer's head. I only saw the backside with its legs extended out on the ground. I can't give you any estimates to how big or tall this was, but if I'm being as accurate as I possibly can be, I will say it was at least as big and wide and tall as a man would, just with a coyote looking face and head. I moved down here with my family to the southwestern region of the United States when I was just 13, so I've heard my fair share of weird stories all throughout the desert. But this, this was the first time I've ever seen something so out of the ordinary like this. I don't try to explain it, I don't try to apply logic or anything that a rational human being would do. I just accept it is what it is and I try and move on with my life. In the back of my mind, I've always kind of believed this stuff happens, but I never wanted to fully accept it. I've even heard more stories that this kind of stuff is common on reservations. I don't know if there's any coincidence to this happening on the Zuni reservation, but I take it for what it is. Anyway, that's my sighting. Do with it whatever you will. There's all sorts of strange accounts and sightings that happen in the White River National Forest, home of the Ute people in Colorado. Stories date back hundreds of years ago of the Utes seeing these large coyote-like creatures, half man, half coyote, seen to even been eating on white men traveling back in the day. Disturbing stories of even travelers being chased into the woods and devoured alive by these creatures. The Utes also fell victim to these same creatures, but not as often because they knew the boundaries, they understood the proper barriers to stay away from these things, and they created the proper wards, the same way they would with any other creature, like a skinwalker, for example, or whatever Ute equivalent they had to that creature, since that seemed to be a mainly Navajo and Apache creature. A lot of the stories that I've acquired over the years occurred back in the 1800s and happened to white men, whether they were just traveling through the area, building civilization, or even just exploring. It was often that these would be attacked by groups of these creatures, drug off, and devoured alive. Their bones would be continuously gnawed on until they were turned to weapons or even dust. I do believe there was written documentation calling these things coyote men, but that is in the hands of the Smithsonian's now, and who knows where that is. The reason that the majority of these things happened back in the 1800s was because that was when man was first traveling through the area. White men, I should say. They weren't familiar with the dangers, the sightings, the surroundings. It was all new territory for them to expand and grow. And all while my sect of Utes had very minimal conflict with the white man, we would try to give them warnings every time they came to the area, or so I was told from stories passed down. Unfortunately, many of them, families included, women, children, elderly, the sick, newborn babies, all fell victim and prey to these things. The coyote men, as they call them, said to be anywhere between five to six feet in height, a coyote head on a human body, very, very intelligent and very aggressive. These beings had a bloodthirst for human flesh, and it didn't take many victims for the Utes to soon discover 
that they need to stay out of certain areas and locations. These coyote men were vicious and relentless. They would even go as far as setting up traps for humans. There were even chiefs at the time, or daughters of chiefs, and some of my tribe's greatest warriors that fell to these creatures. At one point even, I want to say it was around 1820 or 1821, one of the smaller Ute villages was invaded and overturned by these creatures, killing everybody. In modern day times, this entire area is now known as the White River National Forest, and these things are crawling all throughout. My family and I don't live anywhere close to that forest, thank God, because I wouldn't want to put myself in danger, but my family is still heavily into the culture and traditions of the tribe, and they still tell me lots of stories. Even as a child, I was forbidden from entering certain parts of the woods that weren't even close to that national forest, in fear that these things have spread. Had I been a lone child wandering around without the safety of a parent, I would have for sure been snatched and taken and probably eaten alive. Being an adult and understanding a little bit more about the history of America and understanding settlers and how they traveled to the West Coast and the pioneers and all that, I would probably estimate that maybe four to 500 white men in total were chased, attacked, and eaten by these coyote men. It's a rough number, yes, but I'm probably under-exaggerating here. I'm trying to stress to you that many died to these things, which is why a lot of that forest at the time remained unexplored and uncharted, at least to the white men. The Utes had gone to war with these beings several times over the course of several years, losing many good soldiers, women, and children in the process, and only killing a handful of theirs. When I say they were bloodthirsty beasts, I'm not kidding about that. Very often, when I would hear these stories about them, the tribesmen would refer to them with the word they also are referred to as a demon. Nowadays, there are two possible options. One is that these things have receded dramatically and don't attack like they used to, or they have all but died off or retreated entirely from the area. The second is that people are continuing to be captured, eaten, die, go missing, what have you, all while the Forest Service and government keep everything quiet. And I'm not sure exactly which option it is. The rest of the Utes don't really talk about it or even acknowledge it like they used to back in the day. So the age and tradition of my people is slowly dying out. And because of this, we have not been able to warn our people and others properly about the dangers that what we still believe lurks deep within the woods. And believe me, that when I say that these coyote men are not our only enemies, there are many other beings that also coincide, that also cause havoc and wreak destruction and seek to take over our people. In fact, it's many of the same beings you speak about in a lot of your stories online. My purpose in messaging you is to let you know that they are adamant about the destruction of humans. Back when I was 12 years old, and in 7th grade, I was getting ready to go to my county's autumn festival with my friend, we'll call him Ethan, and his brother, who was a couple of years younger than us. Let's call him Danny. We were allowed to go by ourselves, so as long as we promised to return Ethan and Danny's house by 9pm. This was a pretty big deal, as their parents were considerably strict to the point where they weren't even allowed to sleep with their friends when they spent the night. And their friends weren't allowed to sleep over on Saturday nights, unless they brought nice attire to wear to church the following morning. Since it was a Friday night, our plan was to hang out at the carnival and then have a sleepover at their house. It would be the first time our county would be hosting such a large-scale event. Well, large-scale for where we lived, anyway. And practically everybody from school would be there. We were pretty excited and did not want to miss out. We were practically on our bikes as soon as school got out, grabbing things like snacks and money beforehand we went out. It took us about 40 minutes to get there, and by the time we arrived, the place was already considerably crowded. Even though the festival itself wasn't particularly special, I vividly remember everything I did there, and honestly, it's probably because my memory from that day was sharpened, as whole due to the experience later on in the night. Anyway, 
given the crowd, activities to do, and the rides to go on, it wasn't surprising that we eventually lost track of the time. We chained up our bikes and made our way into the festival. We had bought our tickets and decided to go on the rides first as to not lose track of any candy or prizes we might have won. Danny had a fear of heights. So, while I do feel bad for forcing him onto those rides in retrospect, it was funny at the time just to see his reactions to things such as Ferris wheels or the drop tower. He was a champ though and kept up with us all through the night. We played typical carnival games like balloon pops, ring toss, hoops, and so forth. We won a lot of stuff that was basically just cheap and eventually stopped to get something to eat. We found a hot dog stand and grabbed some popcorn while we were at it. We played some more games and explored a bit more before Ethan decided to check his phone and realized it was nearly 20 minutes until 9. We went back and forth in debating whether or not to call his parents and let them know we'd be late. But, both he and Danny were scared that their parents would be mad if they found out that we hadn't been keeping track of time. We knew there was no way we could make it back in time if we went back the way we came. So, we ended up agreeing to take the shortcut through the bike path in the woods. We'd avoided going that way in the first place out of our own superstition. Like with any small town, Myths of things like murderers and monsters came about from school kids, and most common and believed one being that of a crazy old man who lived in a small cabin, kidnapped people, especially children. Once he captured them, he'd scalp them alive and make curtains out of their hair. Everybody liked to act like they didn't believe in it, but it was enough to deter us from the forest under regular circumstances. Looking back, I'm pretty sure it was made up by somebody's parents or sibling, so they wouldn't have to worry about the children responsible for sneaking off into the forest. Regardless, Danny and Ethan were certain they had a 100% chance of being murdered by their parents rather than a hypothetical lunatic in the woods. So, it was a pretty easy decision. We only had the light of the night sky and Ethan's flip phone to guide us. We were supposed to bring flashlights, but it was only then that we'd realized that we had simply forgotten them on the kitchen table. As quietly as we could, we made our way into the woods, and I was even yelled at for having a bit of a squeaky bike, as if it was something I could just fix right then and there. After a couple of minutes of going down the path and nothing happening though, we eventually started easing up a bit, even going as far as to tease each other and laugh about the alleged psychopath murder that dwelled on the grounds. It stopped being funny as soon as we heard the cracking of sticks lightly echoing in the distance. We stopped in our tracks, breathing heavily, and I urgently whispered to Ethan to put his phone away. He did, and we continued to listen for anything new. Nothing happened, so we slowly continued to make our way through. I couldn't help but wince as my bike squeaked and squealed as it rolled forward. Eventually, Danny pointed the silhouette of something a few yards ahead. I looked towards it and made out the figure of a very large and muscular man with a nearly cartoonish proportions. However, there was something weird about his head. It took me a few moments to figure it out, but I realized it looked to be that of a dog's. Before I could even piece together what things might have been, it turned its head to us, revealing a warm, glowing red eyes. I think we were all too shocked and scared to scream. It continued to look at us, but it didn't move. Ethan started slowly moving closer to this creature, and I urged him to leave it alone. But he was absolutely fascinated. The creature spun around back into the other direction, and seemed to walk off. Ethan began to speed up after it. Danny and I pleaded for him to stop, but before we knew it, Ethan was merely feet away from the thing. It whipped its body back around, letting out what I can only describe as a lion's roar from hell. He screamed and began to run down the path, 
and it chase after him full force. I can more easily make it out now. It was completely covered in thick black fur, pitch black fur to be exact, and it had long claws that seemed to be about a foot in length. It almost looked to have bad posture as it moved, as its spine seemed to be at an angle, but it didn't seem to be causing it any trouble while running after Ethan. In an effort to save Ethan, I took one of the prizes I'd won, a small inflated ball with a Spider-Man print, and threw it at this thing, hoping to distract it. It worked, and I didn't even take the time before I started running into the trees, yanking Danny along with me. We hid behind a log, watching as this monster paced up and down the bike path, the sight of its glowing eyes being visible just beyond the tree line. It didn't seem to know where we went, and as soon as it seemed far enough away, quietly as we could, we started moving to go and find Ethan. We eventually found him huddled near some shrubbery, gasping upon the sight of us, then letting out a sigh of relief. We talked as quietly as we could, but still ended up shushing each other. Eventually, we decided to move and slowly walked through the rest of the forest. I remember thinking about how I'd rather have stumbled across the crazy serial murderer instead. We immediately picked up our pace as soon as our neighborhood came into sight and began to full on sprint as we made our way past the trees. We urgently knocked on Danny and Ethan's house's door and their mom opened up, angry as we were 20 minutes past our curfew and that she'd called Ethan to no avail. We all tried to explain at once what had happened, but their mom was just confused. Eventually, Ethan explained and claimed there was no cell service in the woods, which was why he didn't receive her call. I didn't say it aloud, but I was grateful for that, as I knew the sound of the phone going off would have alerted this creature's thing to Ethan's hiding spot, and who knows what could have happened to him if that were the case. Still, their mother didn't take him seriously, or us. She grumbled about she had too long of work today and that she was too tired and went to bed. Once Danny and Ethan's dad came home, they told him about what had happened, figuring there was something he could do and that since he was a cop. Not unlike their mother, he didn't seem to believe us, but he said he'd check it out in the morning and joined his wife in bed. We just decided to try and forget about it and watched a movie instead. Since his parents were so strict, we couldn't even view anything PG-13, as Ethan and I were still only 12. I found it almost morbidly funny, because I knew what we had experienced was far, far scarier than any R-rated horror movie. I was picked up early the following morning, but what I heard from Ethan in school on Monday was that when he and his dad visited the woods, they found all of our bikes absolutely destroyed and mangled, along with all the prizes from the carnival that we dropped while running away. His dad reported it to the other officers at the station, but our story was just treated as another tale to keep kids out of the woods. A lot of my classmates asked me about it, but instead of enjoying retelling it over and over again, I found that I didn't really want to talk about it, it stuck around though, and I was asked about it all the way up until I moved to my sophomore year of high school. By that point, I said the story was a joke or a prank to scare people, just like the psycho murderer tale. It did hurt my reputation, but I knew I was going to be leaving soon by then, so there wasn't much to lose. On the top of that, it helped me get a sort of revenge on Ethan. During our freshman year, we had a falling out when he knowingly asked out the girl I liked. They ended up dating after that, and from then on, I used practically any opportunity I could just to smear his image, even if it meant taking myself down along with him. Of course, I think it's stupid now, and that I was far too dramatic and sensitive over the whole ordeal. The only reason I added this information is because Ethan recently popped up on my People You May Know while I was on Facebook. There's a theory that the algorithm makes it so that those who are consistently looking up at your profile pop up. So if that's the case, 
I'm curious about what made him want to do that, after a full decade of us not speaking. He still seems to live in my hometown, and his profile is full of posts warning about demons and Judgment Day coming. I can't help but wonder if he saw the thing again. I guess I'll never know. Listen, there ain't nothing like living right on the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp over here in Camden County, Virginia. All sorts of strange sounds, sights, and what have you. My family and I have experienced a handful of spooky, unexplainable things that don't make sense. This has been going on since I was just a little kid. My daddy and I have seen beasts of the swamp come right up to our house and press their faces against the back window. Sometimes it's just one of them. Sometimes it's several of them. And they would case the house, looking for spots to try and pry the doors open to get in. These creatures are dangerous. They look sort of like wolves. The faces are dark in color. These things walk on their hind legs, just like a person, and not a dog. They have short snouts, and very human facial features, high jaw bones, human-like facial structures, and sunken in eyes that are very striking. The eyes, they have this unnatural orange glow to them, like something out of a horror movie. It's always scared us to death when these things show up. You can feel it. The first time I had an encounter was when I was a 10-year-old little girl, and I was lying in my bed, drifting off to sleep or almost, when all of a sudden, my room got really dark. I had my blinds and curtains completely open, and my head was against the wall, right underneath my window. Something really big stood in front of my window to block the light coming through, and in that moment as a kid, I turned around, half curious and half scared, and saw the horror that stood on the other side of my window. It just stood there and watched me, and gave me a small smirk and looked away. I was terrified. Those aren't the only other critters we got out here either, because my daddy has seen what he called lizard men emerging out of the swamp waters nearby at night. Sometimes they're drawn toward the porch light at night, so we make sure to keep all outside lights off if we absolutely can. He don't like to take any chances. One time, one of these things walked right up to our car in our carport and hid in the dark. You can hear it making this clicking noise, and you could see the glowing eyes that it had. My daddy fired his gun, and it still didn't even move. Anything that isn't afraid of a gun is something to be feared. When I say the swamp is dangerous, I mean it. Animals that are not supposed to exist thrive out there, and when they don't have to worry about being found, they can just torment those who live near the home without ever worrying. I wanted to mention this before I ended the email. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, we'll find random dead animals all around outside the house. They look to be like they've just dropped dead mid-step. It's so weird. Animals that aren't even really common around here either. We found a dead coyote once by our carport that looked like it had just fallen over and died. No signs of any poison, struggle, nothing. We found a boxer dead too. A few cats, raccoons, all died the same way. My daddy thought they were getting into poison somewhere, but no one around here nor any of us lay out poison that these things can get into. More answers than questions at this point. The worst is during the spring and fall, where at night you can hear all sorts of awful noise. The swamp will get really quiet, and you'll start to hear either these loud dinosaur roars and screams. It sounds like something out of a movie, and it sounds big. Then other times, you'll hear this deep roar that sounds like it's coming from a huge wolf. No doubt it's the swamp creatures that paid me a visit when I was a little girl. The sounds are incredibly loud at night. Other neighbors swear they heard a car being smashed into a tree. Other neighbors claim they will sometimes hear things in their backyards and driveways. I know the folks around here are very cautious and even have spotlights all around to 
ward these things away. From our experience, the swamp creatures are drawn to the light, and we're not sure why. The swamp creatures are very intelligent and know how to find food without anybody noticing. Maybe this is why they come toward the light. Sorry for so many things that don't make sense. We are trying to make sense of it ourselves. All we know is we have a swamp full of critters, like lizard men, and giant dogs that walk on their hind legs. We don't know what to do. I believe my friends and I had an encounter with a werewolf, or some sort of werewolf entity. For the record, I'm a 17 year old kid, and because of COVID, a lot of my friends and I were left with nothing to do. We were avid watchers of ghost hunters and paranormal investigations, and decided it would be a good idea to do our own EVP session out in one of our oldest cemeteries in town. So, we waited one night till around midnight where the four of us can sneak out and go. We get there about midnight, and the cemetery has graves that date back to the early 1800s. It's not very large, but it holds about 70 graves, if I had to take a wild guess. There's a lot of trees and coverage, especially now that spring has come, and everything has grown in. The cemetery has your typical black spiral fencing around, but beyond that is heavy trees and forest, so you can't just walk by on the street and look in. It might even be privately owned, so technically, we were actually probably breaking and entering. Oh well. There's a couple of mausoleums on the far side that I believe were owned by some of the original families here. We found a large gravestone that was sitting by this large dead tree, and thought it would be the perfect place and time to sit down and do our session. We begin our EVP session, asking some simple questions. Being summertime, everything around us was quiet, but I've never been to a graveyard at night, so I was already on edge. In my head, I was thinking crickets should be making noise, but they weren't. My friend kept saying that he felt the energy change around us, and we were invoking the wrong spirits. I thought he was just pulling my chain, because I had not felt a thing, and I'm sitting right next to him. Then, we heard a noise, maybe 50 feet away, behind a couple of the other graves that sounded like rustling, and leaves crunching. At this point, my friend is freaking out, and thinking demons are going to come and take us. Oh, I should also mention that we only have our phone flashlights, for whatever reason. Why we decided not to grab our flashlights at home, I don't know. Maybe we were far too excited. It was a heavily cloud-covered night, lots of overcast, so there was no light from the moon. We continued our session and asked a few more questions with my friend while he is shaking. He interrupts me mid-question, says he thinks there's something over there watching us and points. I said, you're just paranoid. So I shined the flashlight over there, and all of us at the same time we see these tiny red orbs and these tall pointed ears coming from out behind a really large family tombstone, about 40 feet away. My friend jolts suddenly, saying, What is that thing? Is that a demon? I kept my ground and stood still, and I whispered in his ear, Let's get out of here, really slowly. Where's my other two friends were huddled right behind me. We all stood up slowly and backed away to the far side of the cemetery, where this thing continued to watch us and not move from beyond the gravestone. Due to its location, we were actually backing up away from the entrance and we needed to find a way to kind of slyly get around. So we hid behind a couple of tombstones and each of us took turns making a beeline for the entrance. We did this one at a time without this thing ever seeing us, or so we'd like to think. That's the only and last time I'm ever doing an EVP session in a graveyard, and it's kind of killed my desire to do any ghost hunting or paranormal investigation. Since we saw the tops of its ears and its eyes, it looked like your typical werewolf. My friend, the one who was freaked, is convinced we summoned a demon and refuses to talk about it, but honestly, I don't exactly know what happened. I believe we saw something and potentially a werewolf spirit, or maybe a werewolf, 
even though I can't exactly say that's what it was. I haven't told my parents or any of my other friends about what happened, so I'm desperately looking online for answers and people I can talk to about it. We were actually planning on bringing out a Ouija board out there, but with the way the events transpired, boy, I'm glad we did it. Who knows what else would have happened. Part of me wonders if us trying to do an EVP session called this thing in, or if it just happened to be lingering around nearby and saw us and took its chance to watch us and be curious. I've looked online a little bit, and I have seen some similarities between people seeing werewolves in graveyards, but it seems to be mainly Indian burial grounds is the common denominator. I don't know my geography terribly great, but I'm pretty sure there aren't any native reservations or anything around here, so that's checked off the list. Had we not spotted it, who knows if it was truly trying to creep closer and maybe grab one of us. I don't feel like it had the best intentions considering it was hiding and trying to stay incognito. At the same time though, it did reveal half its face and upper head to watch us from afar. I felt it was more curious, but my feelings could very well be wrong. After all, I felt that nothing would happen, so I was wrong there. Maybe it was waiting for the right time to grab one of us, like I said. I'm just glad we didn't stick around to find out. Somehow, when we made our exit out of the graveyard, hugging the outer perimeter wall, we didn't see it anymore, which was equally frightening. I don't know where it went. Maybe it was there guarding someone's grave. Maybe it was someone's pet. I don't know. People say there's a certain kind of energy that lingers around old graveyards, but whether that's true or false, I can't exactly say. I didn't initially feel anything different about the atmosphere around us when we first entered, nor did I really when we left. I was just seeing this creature. I never felt a sensation of anything wrong, per se. Anyway, I'm not here to turn this into a novella. I just have no desire to ever return to a graveyard to do any sort of EVP session at nighttime again. I would have gone during the day, and it might have been a different scenario. I'll never know now, because I am staying far away. Thanks for reading.